levels up because as you will have seen from the program, it is actually a bad agenda. And there's, sadly, there's no break until lunchtime, so we need to keep this energy level up. But welcome uh, to, the, to the conference on the Indo-Ukraine collaboration for health. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, particularly given that it's Black Friday and you're not tempted by all the shopping out there. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously you're dedicated people. Uh, today is a very exciting day for me. Personally, and I hope it will be for you too, because today marks uh, the end of a chapter, but also is the beginning of another chapter. What I mean by that is that, like many of you in the audience, I'm also from India, and over the last few years, I've been going to, uh, very frequently, and certainly for the last three years, uh, four or five times a year, trying to see how we could support health developments in India. And it's not just individuals, there are organizations who are trying to do that, and it's become apparent to me that uh, whilst this is useful, there could be a better way of doing things. How, why couldn't we actually collaborate? We started with a number of workshops in Manchester that starting two years back, and there's a lot of enthusiasm for it. However, there's no ability to take that work forward because we didn't have the infrastructure and systems in place. But today marks the end of that chapter, and starts a new chapter uh, where the new beginning uh, starts because we have a way forward now. And we have a way forward because of the establishment of the Global Health Exchange in the Northwest. I won't steal uh, Jack Burns' thunder because he's going to tell you more about that uh, later on in the program. Jen and I have worked together for many years. Uh, we share similar aspirations. We truly believe health and education is global now and in the global village, we are all interconnected. Uh, in the globally, health inequalities are widening. There are concerns about affordability of healthcare. And there's a big pressure in terms of how do you get the necessary workforce. The Kampala Declaration uh, identified a shortage of 4 million public health workers across the globe, for example. And look at uh, the, the differences in health status. It's no longer inter-country differences. It's no longer India is poor or uh, the UK is better. It's the intra-country differences which are becoming starker. So the difference in life expectancy between Manchester and Richmond is 15 years. If you go down south, you live longer. In India, 40 million Indians fall below poverty lines every year after hospitalization. So these are some serious issues. And what we need to do is to make sure that we develop the adequate workforce uh, to be able to support health developments in both countries. But having aspirations is one thing, and turning them into reality is quite different. And today is about seeing how we can take it to the next level. But in doing so, what we need to, do, to make sure is to recognize that health itself cannot be done dealt with in isolation. Whilst health can generate wealth, you also need to put some money into creating the necessary healthy workforce to begin with. And this is where we need to think about health in the context of overall, not just human development, health development, but also social and economic development. And this is where I'm particularly pleased that we have also got uh, Mr. Oglesby, who's going to address you just after I finish, who's going to tell us more about the work that is going on within Manchester to mobilize the businesses to form business linkages between the Northwest uh, and in the Indian subcontinent. Um, I'm now going to invite uh, Mr. Oglesby to give the first talk. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here to uh, uh, <clears throat> to open this uh, this conference today. Um, what I thought I'd do is, first of all, just talk a little bit about Manchester, about where Manchester is today, and then go on and talk. Um, about Manchester and India and its relationships as I, as I, as I see them. Um, now clearly looking at the, um, at the guest list today, a lot of you know Manchester, a lot of you are from the region, so know and understand what's going on. Um, but my guess is that such is the pace of change that's happening in Manchester at the moment that uh, even those of us who are quite close to what's happening have great difficulty in, 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 in keeping abreast of where we're going because Manchester's at one of those crucial moments when, frankly, it is in the process of reinventing itself. Um, a process that Manchester seems to do fairly often, I have to say. 
Um, I remember when I first came here some 45 years ago now, Manchester was a very different place to the place you see now. Um, if you were to look around you, there were the head offices of some of the international giants uh, of, of industry, particularly in the textile uh, trade, people like Courtauld's, Dyers and Features, Tuchel, um, a whole host of companies. And on the manufacturing side, um, you know, you had a lot of very major inter international companies. And in very short order, they all disappeared. They all, they all, for various reasons, um, yeah, they either got amalgamated by some, with somebody else, or they all, uh, or quite frankly, they found themselves not fit for purpose and, and just disappeared as companies. And Manchester had to reinvent itself, and it did, it did fairly quickly and became very much um, a service centre. And that's uh, that. That is, uh, Manchester was very good at that, and that's the, the backbone of the centre of Manchester which you see here today. However, um, more latterly, um, we've realized that being a service center isn't enough, that we really have to look um, at other areas for the future, um, and we're very much powering ahead now uh, in all sorts of uh, areas such as um, science. We see science as being a playing a hugely important part of, 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 of the future. All heard of graphene. I know that what we've got to do is to make graphene uh, really into something significant, um, and there's a huge amount of money going into that and that whole technical area. Um, but all sorts of other, uh, all sorts of other areas as well, creative and media, um, the whole digital area. So Manchester, in that sense, is very much looking to the future and reinventing itself. Um, it's, it's difficult to express how delighted I am to be standing here this morning. There are so many reasons why that's the case, not, not least of which um, uh, a bit of peace and quiet from the melee, which is the current changes in the NHS, my own organisation, but um, actually the, the enthusiasm that I have for this uh, particular area of work and specifically <coughs> the pinnacle nature of today uh, in a lot of the work that uh, Rajan and I have been engaged in over the last uh, few years can't be understated. Um, and so I do become over-enthusiastic, I apologise, and um, if you don't understand uh, the slightly Scouse accent, non-Mancunian accent, please just put your hand up and I'll repeat whatever uh, I need to repeat. <laughs> um, I'm a surgeon by trade, um, and I'm a surgical educationalist, was a clinical academic uh, for a long period of time, and then about a year ago I, I jumped ship into a new organisation that's been established in, in, um, in the UK. Um, and under the, uh, the healthcare reorganisation of the current government, six new arm's length bodies that are answerable only to Parliament were established to try and manage the NHS in a way that wasn't influenced uh, too much by changing the month by month politics and annual spending rounds. The organisation I work for is an organisation called Health Education England. And what I want to do today is to tell you about Health Education England a little bit and why it is so relevant to this conversation. Um, for my sins, I am uh, what's known as the Director of Education and Quality for the North of England for Health Education England, and I'm also the, uh, the National Lead for International Health and Placements for Health Education England as well. Um, uh, my intention from, uh, is to utilise today to genuinely leverage uh, investment decisions and business plans for NHS workforce moving forward. So the significance of what we decide today really cannot be understated. Good morning. Two strange things happened this morning. One, the first of all, it's not raining in Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> the second, we started at dot of 10. So it's not Indian time, it's an English time. <laughs> Shall we thank Rajan for that? <laughs> Bapio is learning fast and the chairman of Bapio is ensuring that we learn some good things from education. One of them is timekeeping. So Rajan, thank you very much. <coughs> now this is, you see, Michael has left, uh, but he said twice or three times he mentioned Modi, the new Prime Minister of India, and how excited uh, India is with uh, the new um, leadership there. 
And the way India is growing, it's really growing very fast. And those of you who've been visiting India have noticed that, that there is a huge change occurring. And although British ruled India for a few hundred years, it may be that the roles would be reversed in the next few years. <laughs> However, it's not the reversal of the role that we are looking for. It is a lot more of collaboration and equality that we, 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 we meet each other as collaborators and partners together to ensure that the help spreads for all the people in both the countries. That's the vision of uh, BAPIO. Uh, we want to promote leadership and professional excellence amongst our doctors. <coughs> Now this is interesting, 50,000 doctors estimated, I think it's actually more than that and we don't have proper figures because what GMC does is it circulates a um, form where you need to say what is uh, your uh, background and a lot of people would take, uh, they don't want to declare. On that note, uh, Rajan, I'm stopping a minute before, uh, I must thank you for coming here. I'm sure it's going to be a very fruitful day. I think this is the first day, it's the first time BAPIO is collaborating into any sort of event where there is collaboration between Indo-British healthcare. And um, Jay, thanks again for your support and thank you very much. I'm Vijay Gautam. Uh, I would like to call myself our man in India. Um, I hope I'm here not just because uh, I was overcome by madness last year and left a very comfortable job in London, uh, rising to dizzying heights of being associate dean and uh, divisional director and so on, um, but because I was given the opportunity to become the founding chair of a government institution that described as an institute of national importance. So I'm the professor and head of surgery, trauma and emergency in one of the regional aims. And I've been working there for a year. And in equal measure, it has been a satisfying, bewildering and frustrating experience. Uh, Dr. K.K. Agarwal, I'm the incoming General Secretary Indian Medical Association. This visit is my personal visit because I'm going to take over next month. I just heard that uh, BAPIO is working in the field of voluntary work, medical education and training, investment, charity, recruitment, faculty exchange, exchange program for residents, research, but they need a platform. And uh, BAPIO being a medical association of doctors cannot expect the same what they expect from the government, but ultimately it has to be an association to an association. Therefore, we need a IMA BAPIO initiation, a initiative we need a, a collaboration between Indian Medical Association and BAPIO at the national level to, to, to do what IMA wants and to do what BAPIO wants with that. For example, we need a joint declaration because when we talk about medical tourism, uh, uh, Britishers feel that India is not safe. So if a joint statement comes from BAPIO and IMA that, that the problem, the real problem is this, I think it will be much more valuable than the government of India giving a declaration for that. So I think there is a lot of scope from BAPIO and IMA to work together. After what KK has said, it's a tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, I have to do full justice coming here all the way and uh, ensuring that everybody around the table knows exactly where we are, where we are going, what we are doing. So the good news is Indian healthcare still remains with the private sector and like here. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is actually good news. As far as governments are concerned, that is very, very good news because each one of them is struggling to find how do you fund healthcare all over the world. That is my opening statement and an invitation to anybody here who would like to partner with us and find out what is the cost of healthcare. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, first, I would like to thank uh, back you, uh, Ramesh Minta sir and uh, Rajan Madhuk sir for inviting me. Uh, so, uh, uh, my name is Dr. Ravi Kant, I am from Mumbai and uh, the, I am uh, going to talk mainly about my organization for uh, 30 seconds and then uh, what we are doing in Bihar because uh, Bihar is, uh, uh, you will see in the slide uh, what's going on there. So, uh, 
this is the organization uh, i have started this uh, during uh, just after internship uh, uh, from uh, basically it started from km hospital canteen there was a acute uh, shortage of platelet uh, after uh, the outbreak of dengue and malaria fever uh, in mumbai so uh, i have started this uh, platelet donation awareness drive many people they, they were not aware about uh, like simple thing you can donate platelet 24 times in a year every 15 days you can donate platelet so i have started this with platelet donation drive which was very successful covered by times of india and gradually uh, from uh, blood to um, from blood donation we shifted to uh, responding to different disaster in india good morning thank you very much for inviting me and after the extremely depressing situation of different parts of india i hope to bring in some swachh bharat <laughs> <coughs> i would uh, like to start with a distinction between health and healthcare health primarily depends upon three e's education environment and economy environment includes social political physical and that is what actually contributes to health whereas we keep on talking as if health healthcare and doctors are synonymous which it is not and that distinction is extremely important because the greatest optimism that i see with modi coming in is about the swachh bharat cleaning of ganga and the interlinking of rivers because clean india itself is going to reduce the disease burden tremendously if it happens about which there is a lot of cautious optimism this is what is perhaps the biggest story in india to my mind about the swachh bharat campaign really coming to closer home in terms of the organization that i represent indian confederation for healthcare accreditation is a confederation of national associations of all stakeholders in healthcare this is a question for dr shabnam singh you mentioned something about schools involvement in healthcare which is exactly what we're trying to do in uk at the moment could you just shed some light on that please Can you hear me? Yeah, that's good. Um, but you know, the traditional method of education had that you had a system by which you finished school, went into graduation, post-graduation, PhD. So we walked through the last four years of converting this into an outcomes-based competency framework, which has now been christened as the national qualification. framework so you might be a phd but your competency level might be standing at 2 as far as skills are concerned so with that background we decided to start seeding healthcare courses in all schools from standard 9 upwards i really don't know what to make of india i'm very proud of india and last three speakers have really made me extremely proud i'm really grateful that i hear about corruption i hear about corporate hospital pay unnecessary procedures on patients which really upsets me i think we got to do something and we make sure we put the patient in the heart of everything what we do and whenever do because that is the reason why we became doctors i really want to thank to you know congratulate the last three speakers and i think ima gmc everyone has to make sure that we put patient in the heart of everything what we do and we need for the right reason uh one of the biggest issue in india is is the growth the population how is the i may engaged with the government of india to control this growth because that is the root cause of poverty uh, and which talking about the population yes see population control is uh, one factor that is fine and uh, i am a has its own uh, program with the government as far as the family welfare and the health ministry is concerned about the growth of the population simultaneously they are also working with uh, not only controlling the population but also increasing the longevity the communication used to be one part of the case which they were given at that there some negative assessment so whether at all they performing the communication module and they are performing overall well in the case 
they used to be given as a qualifying grade. So we have done few interventions, beginning from assessment, uh, we have dispensed of uh, the concept of long case and we have introduced five cases as such. So one of the cases will uh, definitely focuses on communication. It's a very interesting study that next to abstinence, teenage education, uh, education is the biggest factor in reducing teenage pregnancy. So education is actually the real answer to population control instead of uh, using various other methods. So just a, a few words of introduction. Um, uh, Professor Burns does not need any introduction in this region at, uh, uh, at all and, and internationally is a well renowned uh, researcher, very well published in the field of old age psychiatry. Uh, he's a professor of psychiatry at the University of Manchester. He's the vice dean for the uh, medical school locally. And uh, he's the NHS clinical director for Dementia England. And, and I have a little personal association, you may not remember. When I was doing my research on Huntington's disease, when I was a trainee, I used something called burn scale. And uh, my supervisor said, you need to get permission from Professor Burns because he's the one who had that scale. And I rang him and said, straight away, use it, no problem. Thank you very much. <laughs> that I think you still owe me some money. For <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to accept cash. <laughs> <laughs> can you repeat? In rupees, yes. In rupees, yes. In rupees, yes. rupees, yes. yes. rupees yes. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're a hundred million. <laughs> <laughs> It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, particularly to JS, for the uh, opportunity just to have a uh, just a, a run through for a few minutes about where I think some of the important things are in dementia. And I'd be very happy to, to answer any questions because I think one of the things about dementia is that for sure it's in the news at the moment and it's in the news every day. Sometimes for good, sometimes, you know, uh, there's a couple of co controversial things that we have uh, introduced in, in the last month or two. Um, but what I thought I'd give you a bit of the excitement from my point of view and, and some of the energy uh, that I, I think is uh, around dementia. Important to remember dementia is a syndrome, so dementia is brain failure. So we talk about respiratory failure and liver failure and heart failure. Dementia is essentially brain failure. Um, and so when we talk about some of the fear and some of the stigma, I think it's important to remember that dementia describes a clinical syndrome. Uh, we know the numbers are enormous, 850,000 people next year in the UK will have a diagnosis, but that hides uh, the fact that that's a number you can easily multiply by two, probably by three, and possibly by four, if you look at the number of people affected by uh, dementia. The cost is £26 billion, so in fact it's more than cancer, heart disease and stroke put together. So there's an enormous amount of interest in dementia. And there's a number of things recently that have become uh, important, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention a few of those. I happen to be an allied health professional working in Midland, and I manage the primary care service. That's not bad now. But I'm also a hospital governor, and listening to you, the journey from sequin to treatment, and never mind the management and support of the carers, is a very long journey. Does it happen? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point. One of the things that we're trying to do is to, we've, we've, we've come a huge way in the last three years. But there's, the, 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 there's a lot to do. And uh, one of the challenges, you quite rightly, we concentrate at the beginning and we concentrate at the end, but that journey in the middle is something that we can improve upon. Who survived, you know, for, for, for over the 70s and 80s? They're all suffering from chronic schizophrenia, still some of them have active psychotic symptoms. But these people are developing dementia now. Yeah. Uh, it's, the picture is slightly confusing. I mean, do you want to throw any light on the interface between schizophrenia and dementia? Is there anything? I'll, I'll leave that to the world's expert on dementia, Sean. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm schizophrenia. That was a Freudian slip. Um, uh, uh, in a minute. I guess it's dementia precox. Mm. I guess it's what people used to describe as dementia precox. I see a lot of people refer to our memory clinic with chronic psychosis, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and they've got a, a little bit of memory problems. And I'm really convinced that it's Alzheimer's disease. The interesting question is, does Aricept, does Denepazil work for dementia precox? It might well. Do the, the neuroleptics that people have been on you know, with chronic schizophrenia, there's evidence that they promote cats and tangles in the brain. So could they be? So it's a very, a very interesting area, and I'd be very interested in, in seeing more. I suspect it's, it's what Blanc used to call dementia precox. 
my question, it's my medical secretary's question. Her mother has been diagnosed to have Alzheimer's. And what she wanted me to raise the point was that she and her brother, who are looking after their mother, and he comes down from Scotland periodically to visit her. And what they are saying is, why is there such a disparity in the quality of care that is being given to patients like her mum? And she wanted me to ask this question. I think it's about raising the care and closing the gap. We know there is huge variation. And there's variation of any bit of medicine, whether it be cardiologists, outcomes in surgery, suicidal rates, treatment for schizophrenia, anything like that. We know there is variation across the country. And so the trick and the challenge is, is to improve that. Um, so I don't have an easy answer, but at least now we know in dementia there is, there is that change. People are aware of dementia. People are thinking about it. Okay, so regarding the economic case which you make for the first generation of antipsychotics. Yeah, well, one thing your search very well proves is that's why the mortality rate haven't come down because they haven't moved anywhere in the efficacy of treatment. So they still die early and like they did in the past. But then it doesn't necessarily make a case of going back to the previous era because we moved to the new era because we gave them a lot, lot of stigma with our medications with the first generation. Yes, we might use less dosages, but if we use this perverse economic argument, then we take the choice away from the patient. If they want, they have both the side effects in front of them, they might want to make a choice between the second generation and this, which they once they think they can manage or they would like to live with, as compared to what this. This sort of approach seems to say that the first era was somehow as good as this one. Not necessarily, both are equally bad. We need to move, perhaps we will have someday have better drugs. My question is that have there been trials where we have given antipsychotics on one hand and other patients have been given talking therapy and how well do the medications do as compared to CBT, say for example, first episode psychosis? Uh, so, yeah, so there have been several, so taking the second question first, so in, uh, in first episode psychosis, there are were, were several instances where people think the second generation drugs must be better. One of them is first episode psychosis. There have been various head to head trials, about 11 of them, comparing a second generation drug with a first generation drug in early psychosis. None of them shows any difference between the drugs in terms of effectiveness. One exception. The exception is a head to head trial between propromazine and clozapine in the first episode of psychosis, which was done in China, where it can be described in the first episode. And Showing that clozapine is better than Um You know, this thing about our medical colleagues not getting it is still true, unfortunately, in medicine, in psychiatry and medicine. So I had a referral from an FY2 not so long ago from a teaching hospital not far from here, and the referral was one line. It says, "Dear Dr. Bamra, this patient is on the Liverpool care pathway, but she's showing no signs of dying. Please, would you see an advice?" So how do we get to the pitch where we get medical school students from day one to that early part in their career where their thinking can kind of turn around that way? Because they, I, I deeply believe they don't come to medical school with that frame of mind. You know, they all, you know, I don't know what you said at medical school, but you know, um, I found myself saying what you should never say, I'd like to get people better, you know, because I care, and you think, oh my God, what have I just said? So I, I don't know. Yes. I have understood two important things there in terms of suicide prevention. And unfortunately, I come from Blackpool who has got highest level of deprivation and young suicides. And two things very important I understood. One is the treatment for depression, yeah, SSRI, whatever. And quote unquote at the same time, availability of the psychological treatment, IAP or CBT or whatever plus the, the usual methodology of preventing the suicides, right? The policy of IAPT and psychological behavior tells you, if a person has got a, a, a risky behavior of taking the self-harm, you should not touch that person by barge board. Where do we stand in terms of policies? It's, it's, it's very tricky, you're right. You know, IAPT is a fantastic development in many ways, um, but it just can't work if it's excluding the most vulnerable 
people. So that's a problem. Um, I mean, we do some work with IAP services across the country, and criteria do vary, actually. So in some places, you've got IAP teams who are properly supervised and managed, who, you know, who, will, who will kind of um, engage higher-risk patients. But for us, it's a really important safety setting as well, because for us, levels of experience vary. Um, between different IAP services and for us it's a really important kind of safety setting. We need to know what the safety issues are in that setting because we just don't know at the moment. The key question I would like to ask you is, I mean all of your, your wives, I mean your partners are leaders in the NHS today and one of them is here in Sunday Pranati. I would like to ask you what support, you know, what is it that you provided to your wives to help them achieve their career potential. If I were to ask this to my husband, thank God he's not here, <laughs> say good child minding and good cooking skills. Yeah. So so over to you guys. What do you think you know you did, you know, what support you provided, you know, to your wives in helping them achieve their career potential? Over to you. Oh, well, I go, I go first, do I? Um, with my wife in the room, that's always tricky. Uh, well, I think you know what, what would I, um, what would I, what I advise, uh, what I advise someone else in, in, in that position would be to try and support them. And, and I always say to Sandy, if she hates this sentence, because I always say, do do exactly what you want. And I, and I think she sometimes thinks, I think she a lot of the time thinks it's an off the cuff remark of to do what you want, but it's not. I'm actually saying. Do what you want, do what you think is best, do what you feel is right for you. So if you need to go to a meeting, then you must go to the meeting. And I will do everything I can to support you going to that meeting. Absolutely. Ramesh, with your experience, would you like to add something to this uh, conversation? Um, no, I'm very impressed with what these people have done. Fortunately for me, my wife has been the boss. In a sense, uh, she decided not to be professional and she decided to be a housewife. And she has been looking after me and children, so I've been extremely lucky. But what uh, uh, I thought was very important, and what I have done in my life is respect uh, for whatever she has done. And she feels that respect. So, you know, as long as we ensure that she feels respected and for whatever she is doing, I think that's good. That's really helpful. And uh, just one last question to the three of you. Uh, it is not that easy. I mean, you, you can ask, there could be that mutual support, and there could be that support with the career, you know, either the academic or the management side. There could be the support with childcare, you know, and all other domestic, you know, chores. Um, but still, I mean, it is not without some great challenges because traditionally, you know, women, whether they are working or housewives, you know, some activities, especially childcare and, you know, other washing and cleaning, is traditionally this role is played by women, you know, for centuries. And now, you know, so when that is reversed, and especially coming from, you know, Asian communities, you're not used to that culture back home. So back here, and, you know, how did you find that shift? And what is it you found very challenging? Kishore, do you want to start? As I said, you know, the first uh, five years of the children's life, I think those are a crucial point where you know, you, we really need to um, organize your things accordingly. Um, and um, sometimes, you know, in both may not be working in the same place. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for a year or so, uh, my wife was actually working in Stockton. Yeah. Right. And uh, I was actually working in West Midlands. So fortunately, now our son was two years uh, of age at that time. Mm -hmm. So we had a good uh, child mining arrangement, okay. but which meant you know, I had to do on uh, weekends, you know, Saturday, Sundays, to sort of, uh, travel up uh, okay. there. But some of the weeks, you know, my wife used to be on call, so she used to be at the hospital. So it's, it's just keeping in mind, those are the crucial pinch points. I mean, those, those years are absolutely crucial. Once you pass those years, life becomes suddenly so much easier. Once the children start going to primary school, you feel you know uh, there's a lot to sort of play for, okay. but that support and the organisation of all the you know you need support not only from child managers but you know, maybe from your colleagues as well. Mm -hmm. So you need that help and support from others as well. But those are the crucial years. Okay. You must go through that. You know. So uh, the first five yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, absolutely. Kids. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have two specific tricks that I do. Uh, one is. Uh, uh, I listen. So uh, on the drive back, it's a 40-minute drive for my wife. Uh, so 
sometimes 45, sometimes one hour. And for that half an hour, she will speak and I will listen. Sometimes I contribute, sometimes I don't, but I just listen. Because you want, it's a lot of stress. Helping her to vent yeah, out. Yeah, complete vent out, you pour out, warm it out, speak rubbish, whatever, you know, the day's events. Sometimes these are all very confidential things. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, she's very lucky because my memory is very poor, so I, I don't remember <laughs> any of those things anyway. So it's, it's, it's listen. Thank, Thank you so much. And I think in a lot of the literature, it talks about role models and so you've talked about mm. you know, mentorship and, and coaching, but role models, and they don't need to just be females and females. They can be men advocating and being those mentors. So um, I think I think that's very important. Thank you very much for your contribution. Sorry, Ramesh. Yeah, yeah. I'm just looking at the problem. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was just trying to see because we are trying to see how the women could be leaders, and one of the uh, issue which is in nature is by nature woman is uh, also a mother and mother that feeling motherly feeling of to be able to look after everything in the family mm. uh, I just I'm just trying to ask you is do you think that's a drawback is that a hindrance or are you able to get over that it's a really good point and we could have a whole session on yeah, actually the philosophy the the philosophy and the, 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 the sort of the philosophy and psychodynamics behind yeah. Yeah. that I think there's that's a whole that's next year's about peer session. Yeah, okay. Because I don't think we can answer that simply. Yeah. I think that actually is quite a key yeah. part of the personal development and preparation. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's a very powerful yeah. question, Ramesh. And you know, if in, in my case, I think uh, by you know me taking on a different role, it has actually increased the emotional intelligence for my you know husband. I would say because I can see that. Yeah. So whether you know coming down and you know someone is gaining, I don't know. But you know, probably five six years of research, we will you know get to know more about it because we see more fathers you know carrying yeah. children now, mm -hmm. more fathers attending schools you know yeah. for parental need. Mm -hmm. So it, it's just amazing. You know, I can see that shift now. So, in, but I think it's really important that we need to maintain that balance because I don't want to end up then men then fighting for their rights. You know what I mean? It's just having to achieve that balance. I but, think it's but it is an important point because biology hasn't changed. Exactly. So psychologically, yeah. where where you know, in in the home, yeah. um, how do you support that? So, just a second. I used to wonder. Now I've been operating for twenty years, twenty four years now. The consultant. Why is to eight minutes just? Progressively more and more. Yeah. You can't blame them now for pain relief. You can't blame them now for <laughs> bleeding. You can't blame them for anything. Else. You can't blame them for anything. Yeah, no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, you're sorry. You're responsible. We are doing this for three, four years. Thank you, sir. Absolutely fantastic. Oh, going on. I'm, I'm Subhash. I'm a consultant analyst from Writington. So we are following a base or enhanced recovery program based on yours as yeah. well. And the important so, thing to remember is not our program. It's Scandinavian. Yeah, it's Scandinavian, yes. Yeah. Uh, biggest pro problem, I've got a specific question about the topic you have presented just now, but the main problem we have is some surgeons are skeptical and some surgeons can't infiltrate. Yes. So I don't know how you kind of yeah. come, come around to that. That's one thing, but specifically about the knees, drains and uh, you know, when do they release it and do, we, do they keep a drain for post-operative infusion? That's a specific question about the knee. Um, about 60-70% of surgeons do not use drains at all. So there's a small proportion who use drains, they tend to use a retransfusion drain. Patients can walk with a drain. I don't see why drains should stop you from mobilizing. But the local anesthetic, the question, the point is this. You can use it. There's four studies showing that the, lo the concentration of local anesthetic in the drain fluid is same as plasma levels. So if you infuse it back, they're getting what they already have. It's safe. And there's four proper studies to show that. It's not a problem. So, so the, the real question he had was about convincing your colleagues. True. And I think, I mean, I can tell you about that because mm -hmm. as a colleague, um, I'm a dinosaur, you know, old-fashioned, and I should have been most resistant. But it was uh, when we did an audit and we showed that your patients are going home early and it was the managers who were kicking our surgeon's backside. You uh, still have uh, three people yeah, who would say infection, nerve damage issue. They can say it, but the evidence is not there. So thank you for coming uh, to the Young Doctors Forum parallel session breakout. Um, when I'm mentioning the Young Doctors Forum, a lot of people are saying, oh, but I'm not young. 
Hopefully Raji will tell us a little bit more about the definition of young and whether you feel young in yourself, okay? So it's for everyone, and by definition it's for everyone within 15 years of, of the training, or obviously whilst they're in medical school, or even before medical school, if they want to see what we're about, we're more, more than welcome to do that. Um, so I'm just going to move on just very quickly. These are the objectives. Uh, it's quite similar, these objectives, to Bapio's overall mission statement, which is empowering really professional excellence, which is what we want to try and achieve. And I think that tends to be what the vision wants to be right from medical school onwards. So that's what we're going to try and show you today. So first of all, I'd like to invite Dr. Rajiv Gupta to come up to talk to us about some aspects of achieving personal excellence. And the definition of young. The definition of young, in my view, is different. Young is a person who is still learning, can experiment in life, and can achieve something more than what he had the previous day. And that's, in my view, the definition of young. What by age, the definition of young is not by age. Young is what is inside. Well, there are people, well, sorry? No, it just says, wow, wow. <laughs> 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 you'll see people who are you know dull life I've done they uh, do I need to get out of the bed if you are in that stage you are old whether you're 20 years or 30 years or 40 years whatever if you have a passion to come out of the bed and do the difference in your life and everybody else's life you are young distinguished guests, uh, guests thank you very much uh, for coming to the 2014 uh, conference of Clapping Road in Manchester. So this is quite a historic occasion for many reasons. Uh, now a quick word about Manchester. You heard some of you who, some of who, you who were there for the Lord Mayor's reception yesterday heard a lot about the good things about Manchester. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Manchester which you may not know because Manchester and medicine are very intertwined because it, uh, Manchester itself has an anatomical connection. According to the Oxford University Press, Manchester acquired its name from the word, Latin word, mamusium. And mamusium is breast-shaped hill. So just in case you didn't know that. And the first origin of Manchester is, goes back to AD 79, when Manchester, which has always been a very poor cousin to the rest of the world, uh, became suddenly because of its textile origin, and that's where India comes in, Textile businesses made Manchester where it is now. Indeed, Ahmedabad and Ludhiana, as you're aware, are known as Manchester's of India. Because we've said that we will use this fund, two and a half billion pounds a year, every year, to pay for, by the end of the Parliament, an extra 8,000 GPs and 20,000 uh, nurses and 3,000 community midwives and 5,000 home care workers. That two and a half billion pounds a year time to care for will respond to the new needs of the NHS. More staff, which is urgently needed, more time with patients, which has been ignored for a while now. We need to get <coughs> at least 15 minute calls, particularly for vulnerable elderly people. And we need for older people and frail people to be looked after adequately, whether that's in home or in hospital. Now we've said where this will be paid for, and it's for mansion tax. Every penny of the £1.7 billion uh, that it will raise, but also from an additional levy on the tobacco companies, an industry which costs the NHS more than £3 billion a year. And it's a levy very similar to the one that operates in the United States of America. Thank you very much, and you, uh, I'm the chairman of I'm the chairman of Bobby, but what I'm not what I'm going to say in my personal capacity. I'm one of the Jarrow marchers. I did the theatre by and large from Jarrow to London a couple of months ago. Uh, and I'm, it was a very interesting experience. Uh, I'm looking out for your papers in January that you Refer to. I hope certainly the public health paper will reflect the discussion that we had right here actually two months ago in the French uh, Labour Party with the scary of that session. But I'll make two points actually, I'll be brief the uh, chairs. The two points which I think the Labour Party really needs to reflect on are firstly, that you know yourself, the People's March made five pledges, yeah, and the climate was there in Trafalgar Square, so was uh, Andy Burnham. And what I'm looking out for is, where is that 
where are those flight pledges in your proposals? Clive Hanford's bill, it does not actually address all of those points. In Clive Hanford's bill, it was very shocking to see the pictures of the chamber when Clive's bill was being discussed. It was totally empty on the coalition side here. It's shocking, actually. So I, I, I give you guys credit for actually taking it to the next level. But my concern is that it's not answering the questions that people are asking. It is already in danger of getting watered down. There is a simple solution here. 72 billion pounds is logged up in PFI against the loan of 12, 12 billion. Yeah? North and Rio just can't afford to buy it out. Where is your money? Get rid of the financial situation in one sweep. Yeah? So there are solutions there. The second one is, and that is not just Labour Party issue, it's a general issue. People have lost trust in political processes. Yeah? And there is no accountability. Zach Goldsmith's uh, bill on recall has failed. How do we hold people accountable? Tony Blair got elected. We marched. Four million people marched against the right part. No, no reaction. We could not actually hold you accountable. Coalition comes into power on a manifesto promise of no change. They introduce the biggest change ever, which could be seen in the states. How do you hold? How do we hold you guys? And that is where I think there's a big, big problem in our political system. And I'm not party political, but you are you are our hope at the moment. But you must not assume it. You have to demonstrate these bills that the, your papers when they come out in January, I'll hope will reflect some of those sentiments. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 you want to answer? No, I can answer. You are the result. Two, two very good points. I'll start with recall, actually, because um, although it doesn't really link in with the NHS, it does. Um, re recall, there was a private member's bill um, by Zach Goldsmith, uh, which failed. And then the government brought in a bill uh, this year um, that was a watered-down version of Zach Goldsmith's original uh, intentions. And that was that uh, if uh, a member of parliament is found to have broken the law or done wrong, um, the constituents of that MP would be able to petition uh, to uh, force the MP out of office and to force a, a fresh election in that constituency. And Zach tabled some amendments to try and get the government bill to reflect more what his original intentions had been and the government used their majority to, to effectively block that. So um, the, the, the recall bill has passed to the House of Lords, but it's not passed with uh, some of the amendments that I know Zach would have liked. Um, you know, the title is adversity. I'm afraid I haven't had any adversity, so I don't know what to talk about. And of course then uh, somebody said, well, of course, you have had adversity, but you don't realize you've had adversity. And to my mind, just at this point in time, my one adversity is JS. Um, he's had me trawling around the country, in the particular one that I remember, which I think I spent about 13 hours traveling there and back, was to talk to about a number of psychiatrists. Psychiatrists, me. Um, and I really felt I needed psychiatric enough at the end of the day. Anyway, you know, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the question. And I think I want to talk a little bit about my training and Right, so just, just really talk about, I, I think if I go roll back the years, I wouldn't have been anything else. I think being a doctor is, is one of the best things you can possibly do. It's, uh, and it, it's your colleagues, your giving, it's the compassion and so on that you show to your patients. Um, and of course, we're all working for the benefits of our, of our patients. And I think if you take back the, uh, even further to this sort of 18th century, where doctors really didn't have any tools, but all you had was your empathy, your compassion, and your altruism to actually be by the patient, be by the family as somebody died. And I just feel sometimes in our current sort of wrong utilitarian society, where we're just absolutely bound by guidelines, by doctors, by what's coming down from the top, um, we are losing our compassion. I just hope we don't. We somehow taking our focus away from the patient uh, because all the other things we've got to do. Shikhar, thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, you mentioned about Gravin's art of presenting without slides. 
but when you reach the last altar of the century, your gray cells die. In my case, that is a fact. And you require this kind of reminder that what you want to say, otherwise you will start talking about emergency medicine, which you are probably not interested at all. And uh, talking about adversity, and uh, here is uh, a person who has been in this country for 45 years. Can you tell me about that? Like most of you, I speak no English. I don't want to insult you by giving you the definition of uh, triumph and adversity. But what happened was that when your Shakti Purush invited me to talk about uh, triumphing in adversity, I changed the title triumphing over adversity. And then I look at it that what am I going to say and tell you about triumph and adversity. I thought, let me remind ourselves what I mean by triumph and what I mean by adversity. And there is no one here who could raise his or her finger and tell me that he or she has never been faced with an adverse condition in his or her life. But history gives us wonderful examples. Examples of Mahatma Gandhi, whose non-violent uh, uh, fight against the empire and uh, Mandela and, and his park, the park is named after him, opposite my hospital. His fight against apartheid and uh, uh, wonderful, those words, I had a dream that men fought against the racial segregation. And it is not one particular race in the world which faces <coughs> adverse conditions. Because when you look at Einstein, he had a similar problem. At the age of seven, he scored sent a letter to his parents, please don't send him back. We cannot tolerate him in the school. This guy is never going to go beyond this particular standard. Tom Edison had a similar problem as well exactly the same problem. He came home with a note from his school where the teacher wrote that he's absolutely stupid. Oprah Winfrey, someone said to her that you are unfit for the TV job that she was applying for. And she's probably had the biggest TV empire in the world. So in my personal opinion, and this is purely my personal opinion, that I agree with what Martin Luther King said. And although he said about man, it applies to men and women. I don't think that to both genders, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort, but where he stands during the challenges and controversies. And this applies very much to this particular group. And this group who has been learning the energies, I use the word learning the energies for 45 years. And how do we face that? It's the leader, in my personal opinion, who learns from conflict and adversity. And we are all leaders of ourselves. I'm not talking about national leaders. I'm not talking about college leaders. I'm not talking about international leaders. I'm talking about leaders in one's own life. Uh, it's truly a pleasure to be here with you today and in fact a particular privilege to be speaking after the, the last inspirational messages we heard from Dr. Kodiwala. Um, however, I must say that when Ramesh invited me to speak at this session entitled Triumph Over Adversity, I did ask him whether I was the appropriate choice in front of an audience where so many of you are testament to have climbed far steeper mountains, often walking barefoot, without the aid of walking boots, without a compass or map to guide you. And in spite of all these adversities, so many of you have reached the highest of summits. By comparison, like many other second generation Asians, I've had it relatively easier. Nevertheless, I've not been immune from experiencing and witnessing adversity, and I'd like to share with you my observations over the years. Firstly, a little bit about myself. I'm of Indian origin. I came to the UK at the age of seven when my family emigrated from East Africa. I was educated in a grammar school in North London, 
I trained at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London, during which I had the privilege and honor of being taught general medicine whilst doing a firm under the leadership of none other than Parveen Kumar. Thank you. Um, my, my first challenge in adversity came in 1986, when I was completing my house jobs and applying for a GP vocational training scheme. Incredulously, hard to believe, general practice was at the time the most popular and competitive postgraduate specialty. I was taken totally by surprise and gutted when I received nine straight rejections without interview, despite having an impeccable CV and was not even given the opportunity to show who I was and what I was capable of. I then spoke to my GP tutor, who advised me that it could have something to do with my name and ethnicity. You remember that Sam Everton's work at the time, um, we moved a long way from then, but, but anyway, my GP tutor advised me to change tack and forcibly make myself known to the selection panel before my next application so that they could put a face and person behind the name. So I went to Charing Cross Hospital, knocked on the door of the postgraduate tutor, told him all about myself and how much I wanted to join his vocational training scheme, and I handed in my CV before actually applying. He probably felt some obligation to offer me an interview, for which I prepared crazily, such that I knew more about general practice, its curriculum, the contract, and the politics than most of the GPs on the interviewing panel. And I was offered one of two places out of 180 applicants. I learned from that moment on that it really was all about that first hurdle of getting through the door. But I also learned the importance of having to be distinctly better prepared and go that extra mile compared to others. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for inviting me to do this. Um, I'm going to actually take off my GMC hat at this point uh, and actually speak um, as with a hat that I wore uh, during the Shape of Training review, and that was a secretary to the review. And I'll explain the importance of that um, as I go through, but I think it's important to say that the General Medical Council were only one uh, group in terms of the sponsorship of this review, um, and so it's not entirely the GMC's view, as it were, uh, and I don't think we would want it to be seen as such because this was very much a collaboration. So, um, what will we put together to do? Well, we'll be asked to consider potential reforms to the structure of postgraduate medical education and training to ensure that we continue to train effective doctors who are fit to meet practice in the UK and provide high quality and safe care and very importantly the needs of patients and the service now and in the future. Just a small job really. And we were given effectively about 15 months to bring the, together this uh, um, review. And I think that's just uh, important to recognise. Uh, the Canadians have spent actually something like five years doing a similar process. Uh, and are now spending another five years implementing it. So uh, this is, we, we have to bring together something very quickly. <coughs> it is a fairly high level framework with examples <coughs> rather than a completely worked through process. And, uh, and I hope people see it in that way. It is really important that uh, we do focus on the changing needs of patient society and health services. And I think we've already heard quite a lot about that this morning. The, the need for more public health work, the need for more better understanding of the continuity of care, etc. And that's uh, why we were considering that in, 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 in the review. Thanks, uh, Jake. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think Ken said yesterday about if you're going to make a presentation, have just a few key points to make. And I've actually got only three points to make. But before that, um, I'm going to digress a bit. Uh, I was talking to Praveen last night at the dinner. I mentioned to her about the Medical Benevolent Fund, and, and uh, I was a trustee of that a few years ago. And I was amazed at the tragedies that I came across. And she said, well, why don't you say something? So I'm saying something about it now. Uh, and it's a really worthwhile thing to support, because you know the dividing line between genius and madness is very fine. And the number of 
medical students and junior doctors that I came across who were living off pavements and trashing in bins because they wouldn't follow medication and they had paranoid schizophrenia and all sorts of mental illness and so on. It was really quite heart rendering. So it's really a worthwhile thing to support and, and I would strongly urge you on that. The other bit that I digress with is uh, Kailash said this morning that 100% um, Indian and British. So I'm coming from that, so I'm going to try and have a bit of fun and perhaps a little bit tongue in cheek um, uh, try and um, try and break, break the ice a bit with you and try and uh, freshen up a few things. Um, it was a marvelous session uh, this morning, fantastic, amazing role models who've achieved so much in their lives. And now you've got to listen to me. <laughs> and Ramesh, when you meet Neil Dixon next time, you can translate this for him. John Mamithi. John Mamithi. To Saf Kedete. John Mamithi. To Saf Kedete. Muskrane ki kya zrulu. So I represent the Royal College of Physicians. And the Royal College of Physicians is actually a membership organization and also a, a charity. We have 30,000 members and have to encompass 30 different specialties. And so we have a very, very broad church. And so the shape of training initially was welcome to the open arms because it's a really good idea, a great idea. Let's um, make training better for everybody. Let's make the whole system work for the benefit of the patients. But I'm afraid the phrase, the devil is in the detail, has been um, what, what we've been going through now. And one of the problems that it's, that it's raised for us is that some of the definitions that we're needing to use are a bit complicated. So what is generalism for a physician um, when we represent more than 30 different specialties? And when our professional identity as physicians over the last 20 or 30 years has been defined by what kind of ologist we are rather than being a generalist, so the first thing that we need to do as physicians is to celebrate generalism without taking away from specialism. And the, the language we're trying to use at the moment is to say that you're a better specialist if you're a good generalist too. And this all chimes in with the work that the College of Physicians has been doing with the Future Hospitals programme, uh, where in 2012 we produced a document that said that acute hospitals were in crisis and it's because most of the patients that we admit are over the age of 65. Most of them have multiple comorbidities, um, and most of them have chronic disease. And the hospitals can't cope. And in order to cope and provide people to, to do the acute take, we, meet, we need to have more uh, generalists, more people who do generalism. But in an environment where we have been for 20 years really plugging that specialism is what makes you a good person, a good doctor. So, so that's a, a, a big problem for us. However, we're reasonably pragmatic and so we thought, okay, how, how are we as a group of physicians going to wait, make this work? And there are three things that are going to help us to do that. So this is the Royal College of Physicians Shape of Shape where we are at the moment, um, that fits in with what we understand of the, of the Greenaway recommendations, which is two years foundation, that's fine, then selection into internal medicine. Now, we suggest that the generalist component of internal medicine gets increased to three years uh, to allow people to do mandatory <coughs> items that include the specialists that are coming in through the front door, which is where we, we have our main problem. Bringing my perspective uh, about uh, managing change in such a, I would say, diverse system comprising of the council, professional associations, partner institutions, and uh, the biggest of them all, the public body which uh, funds the entire system. We have had no change in the Indian health education system since 1991, and uh, we have inherited a British legacy as far as our medical education system is concerned. 
And only one reason which I would attribute to that is changing role of organizations. It's not like they have not attempted any change and change of this magnitude. We have attempted even uh, bigger changes. The biggest one uh, which was attempted was two years ago when we decided to merge all the professional councils and redefine the role of organizations. Then we, uh, going back, we attempted a similar change in 2005, 2001. But the single reason why we could not do so was because of changing the role of organizations. And the way I see in this, uh, uh, pro this uh, <coughs> project is the organizations will have to accommodate and reinvent themselves because uh, the problem which is envisaged today is resulting from over-specialization and uh, it is having a direct impact on uh, the quality of care being provided and uh, the next impact is that on the finances, as I understand, on the budget of every hospital, that the over-reliance on specialization is putting a, a direct strain on the systems. What a riveting discussion. I'm just going to take perhaps a slightly left field view here, and not talk about generalism and specialism, but talk about the concept of a global physician. Uh, why can't we develop curricula or training which is acceptable and approachable? I know that there are certain criteria which require specialists or more particular training to a particular place where you work, but the vast majority of physician training is actually very general. And why can't we take a step forward and what are the obstructions to that pathway of having a regular, similar training pathways all over the world which will improve communication, which will improve training standards, and will also make improvements in patient care everywhere, and we can learn from each other. We're talking about defining career pathways over here, but there's never been a sincere thought on actually utilizing this pool to lead the care by providing some sort of touch-up, pop-up training to get them into the mainstream possibly because of a cultural dealing between the SAS and the people coming from the training pathway. Here you have a pool of people who are reasonably well skilled, very skilled, but maybe missing a few links. It will not cost as much to train these people and then utilize them as the generalist, which most of them are, and lead the care which is currently thought to be and to be led by consultants. Now, there's never been a national thought on this to actually amalgam amalgamating that pool into the mainstream. At this point, when the career pathways are being thought of, decided, I think uh, Dr. Um, Oswood did mention about some consultation with the SAS, but probably a more serious thought on utilizing that. Uh, global citizens, yes, there's an awful lot. Uh, certainly in my uh, international examining, it's very clear that there's more that defines the similarities between doctors from different countries than, than differences. Um, and so uh, being a global citizen and having a global curriculum would be fantastic. So the problem for me, as a UK physician, is that there seem to be two shows in town. One of them is UK doctors and the other one is US doctors. So who do you want your global citizen to be? Do you want them to be from a UK stable or do you want them to be from a US stable? Now I would say, because I'm biased and because um, I'm totally focused on the College of Physicians, that, that the uh, quality of clinical skills that you get from a UK focused training program is more appropriate to the global citizen. So the answer is yes, but can it be our system, please? Which is a bit <laughs> funny, isn't it? Uh, SAS doctors, I completely agree. Uh, an untapped resource, uh, orphan doctors who are not necessarily on anybody's list but are doing a fantastic job at propping the NHS up. We need to know who all the SAS doctors are and we need to start valuing them and supporting them. Thank you. Um, I, it is a great shame that it's our pal um, of such high power and not be given longer, but unfortunately we have to call it a day. Uh, thank you very much to the panellists uh, and to uh, all of you for listening. I mean, it's a, a very stimulating discussion. Thank you.